makes me treat you the way that I do. Gee, baby, ain't I good to you? I've been unsatisfied with the videos about gun violence and gun control that I've seen on YouTube. It is unsatisfying to me when videos shoot from the hip or complain about what they hate about either or both sides of the gun control debate, substitute heuristics or quips for argument and drone on about anecdotes and analogies instead of addressing the issue. The use of analogies and argument is not necessarily bad when the analogy is used as an illustration or an example, but alone it cannot support a conclusion about the subject for which you are analogizing. At some point, you have to make arguments about the actual issue. Regulating guns is not the same as regulating drugs or abortion or cars or nuclear weapons or anything else, no matter how useful those analogies may be sometimes as illustrations. When those discussing the issue of guns and their regulations rely heavily on analogy, it becomes boring very quickly, as it just dances around the issue rather than addresses it. Ultimately, arguments about gun control must rise or fall based on the data for guns, not for anything else. Dancing around the issue is particularly annoying for gun issues because guns, gun violence, and gun control have been studied for so long that there is data to be had, so it is totally unnecessary to resort to talking out of one's ass. When someone resorts to catchphrases, political talking points, or other things like that, it could be a sign of weakness for that side's argument, but not necessarily. It could just mean that they haven't looked into it very much. Or it could mean that they really do know what they're talking about, but they've decided that rhetorical devices are more effective than logical arguments based on the evidence. If you are one of those who have been shooting from the hip, I'm not going to assume that you're an idiot, but it does annoy me and such arguments do nothing to convince me. I decided to look into the issue for myself. Since I knew there was data to be had, I sought out scholarly research on the subject. I used Google Scholar and JSTOR. I also used some academic databases which are not free to the public, such as Hein Online, and online access to academic journals through the library at my university. Not all of the sources used in this video are available for free on the internet, for which I apologize. However, if you are a student, you may have access to some of this material through your library. I began with a search for pertinent keywords such as guns, gun control, gun violence, firearms, firearm regulation, guns and homicide, firearms and homicide, and so on. I then broadened my search by looking at the sources used in the sources that I found, looking at how different studies cross-referenced each other, and looking at sources which were cited frequently. As I went through these, I eliminated a few that looked like they would be useful at first, but turned out to really be on a different topic. One, on one particular internet source, the Harvard School of Public Health, I was not satisfied with their blanket, firm statements, so I read the studies to which they cited to make sure that their sources reasonably supported their conclusions. Sources that I did not use were individual news reports, editorials on gun control or gun advocacy websites, infographics, and any of the shit that you people post on Facebook. I will be looking at three issues. One, is gun ownership related to homicide? Two, is self-defense a significant benefit of gun ownership? And three, are efforts to curtail gun violence effective? I have intentionally excluded the issue of guns and suicide for a couple reasons. First, I think suicide by firearm is highly susceptible to the substitution effect, whereas homicide by firearm may be somewhat susceptible, but it should be less so than suicide. Second, the main issue most of us are concerned about right now is the use of guns on others rather than suicide. I was going to include a quick look at mental health and the propensity for violence, but I decided to cut it for time. This video will be long enough without it. Though it is an important contemporary issue, I am reluctantly sacrificing it so that I can give adequate attention to the three issues I will be addressing. One important writer who opposes gun control is Gary Kleck. Kleck is prominent in the academic debate over the relationship between gun prevalence and gun violence. Kleck's decidedly pro-gun position should not lead anyone to disregard his work in the field. Quite the opposite. It is impossible to be literate in the subject without reading Kleck's research. 
One study by Kleck and Michael Hogan found that there was a weak effect of gun ownership on homicidal behavior. This 1999 study was in response to a case control study by Arthur Kellerman et al., which found that keeping a gun in the home is independently associated with an increase in the risk of homicide in the home. Kellerman's study found that the presence of one or more firearms in the home was st strongly associated with an increased risk of homicide in the home. Adjusted odds ratio 2.7, 95% confidence interval 1.6 to 4.4. Kleck pointed out some problems he had with Kellerman's results, which were contrary to what Kleck expected to find. Kleck pointed to underreporting of gun ownership, which could skew Kellerman's results. Kleck also took issue with the generalizability of Kellerman's study because Kellerman did not qualify the conclusions with respect to the subsets of the population to which they may apply. Kleck then applied the case control study to homicide offending, contrasting killers and non-killers. Kleck found a positive ratio of 1.36 for persons with a gun killing, which was one-fifth as large as Kellerman's result. Kleck controlled for 10 other variables, male, black, Hispanic, age, income, married, education, South, kids, and veteran. The result is important as it comes from a gun control opponent. Despite adjusting the Kellerman methodology, Kleck still found a positive association between gun ownership and homicide, though a weak one. He does suggest that some adjustments and additional confounding factors could show this weak positive association is spurious. Despite his best efforts, though, Kleck was not able to make the positive association disappear. Other studies did not find an association between gun ownership and gun violence. One study is by Kovanzik, Schaffer, and Kleck in 2005. The paper looked at previous research adjusting for what they consider indigeneity bias. Among the indigeneities the study points to uh, is reverse causality, which pops up in a number of Kleck papers. The idea is that though gun prevalence may influence homicide rates, the reverse may also be true. Homicide rates influence gun prevalence. There are also difficulties in measuring gun ownership, which requires researchers to resort to proxies. After addressing these indigeneities, the study concluded that the positive association between gun levels and gun homicides disappears or reverses. At least one researcher, John R. Lott, supports a more extreme conclusion, that allowing citizens to carry concealed handguns reduces violent crimes, and reductions coincide very closely with the number of concealed handgun permits issued. The Kavansik Schaeffer Kleck 2005 study advises treating this reverse association with caution. The conclusion that there is no positive association between gun ownership and gun crime is also supported by Moody and Marvell in 2005. Not every study reaches this result, though. For starters, we have the Kellerman study that Kleck criticized. It is still data that must be considered. One study that found a positive association between gun ownership and gun homicide was the 1993 study by Martin Killius. This was an international study that looked at data from 18 countries using International Crime Surveys, ICS. The United States and Northern Ireland were outliers among the countries included in the study, so calculations were done both with and without the U.S. and Northern Ireland, so you can see how these two extreme cases may skew the data. Killius found a strong correlation between gun ownership rates and homicide rates, 0.476, which becomes stronger when the outliers are included, 0.610. The conclusion that gun density is positively associated with homicide rates is supported by the 1991 research by David McDowell, which looked at firearm availability and homicide rates for a single city, Detroit, from 1951 to 1986. McDowell found that the data was consistent with the hypothesis and fit the model in which increases in gun density resulted in higher rates of murder within the city. The study is significant for the length of time it covers, though it is susceptible to criticism for generalizability and uncontrolled variables. For a more recent and broader study, there is the 2009 research by Charles C. Brannis and his colleagues. Uh, this study adjusted for confounding factors and still found that individuals who were in possession of a gun were 4.46 times more likely to be shot in an assault, and 4.23 times more likely to be fatally shot in an assault than those without a gun. There is also the Kleck case control study, previously mentioned, which looked at macro-level studies of the impact of gun levels on violent crimes. Table 1, on page 279, lists a number of studies which addressed the issue in various ways, uh, and whether their results showed an, a significant positive association between guns and violence. Of the 19 listed studies, 12 showed a positive association, while 11 did not. 
One of the studies showed, that showed a positive association was by Kleck in 1979. To further sort out the mix of positive and negative results, we have Lisa M. Hepburn and David Hemingway's 2004 survey of the literature on the issue. This paper is extremely useful because it casts a wide net and looks at a broad array of studies. Uh, the review looks at Kleck, Lott, Kellerman, Killius, McDowell, and many others. Hepburn and Hemingway looked at case control studies, cohort studies, international studies, U.S. studies, time series for cities and states, national time series, and cross-sectional studies. Considering the different types of studies, the strength and weaknesses of their methods, and the balance of the results, Hepburn and Hemingway concluded that the available evidence is consistent with the hypothesis that higher levels of gun prevalence substantially increase the homicide rate. Additionally, there is no net beneficial effect of firearm ownership. They cautioned that this does not establish causation. There is naturally resistance to the conclusion that having more guns available takes lives rather than saves lives. In particular, Kleck seeks to establish defensive gun use, DGU, as a significant positive benefit of gun ownership. In 1995, Kleck and Mark Gertz attacked the generally accepted notion that DGU was rare and that the probability of a gun owner using the weapon in self-defense was very low. In particular, Kleck took issue with the National Crime Victimization Survey, NCVS, which estimated that only about 0.09 of 1% of U.S. households experience a DGU in any year. That's between 68,000 and 82,000 per year. Kleck and Gertz attempt a more comprehensive and focused survey to, de to determine the real rate of DGU per year using a random digit dial telephone survey. They came up with a number significantly higher than the NCVS number, estimating a whopping 2.2 to 2.5 million DGU per year. Wow. Philip J. Cook and his colleagues found some problems with Kleck's methodology. Attempts to measure DGU involves estimating a rare event where a small false positive rate will lead to a relatively large overestimate. There are factors which would tend to lead to false positives rather than false negatives, such as the view that DGU is seen as a heroic act, survey respondents' desire to present themselves favorably, and telescoping. Additionally, the term defensive is ambiguous because there is no sure way to assign fault in a violent encounter. The NCVS, despite the flaws of which Kleck complains, actually minimizes the false positive problem by the way the questionnaire is structured. Between the Kleck estimate and the NCVS estimate, the NCVS still provides the more reliable data. Hemingway added to these criticisms of Kleck's survey. The sample was not random because the interviewer asked to speak to the male head of the household. Males and people from the South and West were oversampled. The overestimation of DGU is not the only anomaly in the survey, as it also missed the mark on the percentage of American households which possess a gun and the percentage of the population which is black. The Kleck number on DGU appears to be a wild overestimation. Sources which indicate extremely rare annual incidents of DGU appear to be more reliable. There are some studies that conclude that gun control has no positive effect on gun crime. One such study is by Lynn Murtha and Suzanne L. Smith in 1994. Their paper took a historical approach rather than the typical sociological mathematical approach in the other scholarly works I have read. This conclusion is also supported by a 2012 economics paper from Finland by Mari Viren. On the more local level, uh, the team of Britt, Kleck, and Bordua concluded that the D.C. gun law showed no statistically significant intervention effect on homicides. There are some studies that point in the other direction. A 1997 study by Ik Wan Ji Kwan using a multivariate statistical regression model suggested that there was a weak relationship between the existence of gun control laws and a deterrent effect on gun deaths. A later study by Kwan in 2005 using a different method got more positive results. The states with the most comprehensive gun control legislation experienced, on average, one to almost six fewer gun-related fatalities than those states with the most lax laws. Kwan was more confident in calling gun control laws a deterrent, but also pointed to socioeconomic and law enforcement variables, which are also important. One problem with determining the effectiveness of gun control laws in the U.S. is the varying laws in different states. There are many different ways states try to tackle the issue and some methods may be more effective than others. A jurisdiction may have one law that has a good deterrent effect, 
but another law that is counterproductive. It is important to sort out what type of law you're looking at to determine what works best. There is a study that does just that. Makarios and Pratt did a meta-study of various efforts to reduce gun violence and looked at their effectiveness. They found that the effectiveness of gun laws ranged from weak to moderate, with law enforcement interventions such as policing strategy, probation strategy, and community programs having stronger effects. Looking more closely at their data reveals that some types of gun laws had very low effectiveness, especially safe storage laws and waiting periods and background checks. Law enforcement programs are more effective than gun laws. However, the gun laws that are the most effective are bans on the sale of firearms. Makarios and Pratt do not suggest abandoning gun laws in favor of law enforcement strategies. The most effective programs combine both punitive and supportive strategies to effectively reduce gun violence. The balance of the data supports the conclusion that guns are associated with increased homicide rates, with no net benefits such as self-defense. The data does not support a definite causal relationship between guns and homicide rates. The balance of the data supports the conclusion that self-defensive use of guns is extremely rare and far outweighed by offensive use. The balance of the data supports the conclusion that gun control laws do have an effect on gun violence, though other efforts are more effective and gun control laws must be used in concert with other efforts. The most effective gun control laws are outright bans. That is as far as the data can carry us at this point. Gun control supporters might be happier if I reach more definite conclusions, but I have to go where the data takes me. It would be easier to reach definite conclusions if all of the data pointed only in one direction. I have read enough, though, to feel very comfortable about my conclusions. A multitude of studies using different methods covering different regions and time periods point to these conclusions. Yes, there are studies that point the other way but the scales tip in this direction. I think any fair-minded reading of the literature would conclude that. There are some popular claims that can be ruled out as unsupported by the data. One, more guns reduce crime. Not true. Only a small part of the scholarship supports this conclusion, and it is less than reliable. The self-defense effect is so small that it can't outweigh the dangers involved in gun prevalence. Chances are very small that you're going to go Bruce Willis on an attacker. That is fantasy. The reality is you're more likely to be injured or killed by a gun than to protect yourself with one. Two, if you ban guns, criminals will get them anyway. Not entirely true. Pushing the gun market underground creates trade frictions, which increases transaction costs for the criminals seeking illegal firearms. Some criminals will get guns, some won't, and the risk of trying to acquire a gun increases. The opportunity for law enforcement intervention also increases. 3. Gun control doesn't work. Not true. It does, but the effect depends on what type of gun laws are in place and whether they are accompanied by law enforcement programs. Based on all of this, I would support additional gun control laws, especially if accompanied by supportive law enforcement programs and programs to address socioeconomic problems which also contribute to gun violence. However, if the programs are not forthcoming, I would choose gun laws over nothing. Gun control may have limited effectiveness, but a weak positive effect is better than no effect at all, and it would save a few lives. It would save more lives than depending on guns to provide a means of self-defense. Saving a few lives is not like saving a few miles per gallon on gas. The benefit can justify a higher cost. But of course my hope would be that we could have a more comprehensive strategy of which gun control laws are a part. I would prefer not to rely on the least effective means. A quick comment on the tone of this discussion. <clears throat> everybody has opinions on this subject. Everybody is a self-appointed expert. Everybody thinks everybody else is an idiot. But these squabbles and flame wars are utterly boring to me. The reality is most people don't know very much about gun violence and gun control. Uh, some people are right about the subject, but they're right for the wrong reasons. Uh, watching people do battle over this very complex subject in 140 characters or 500 characters uh, using infographics or Facebook posts or whiny YouTube videos is like watching two dead fish fight a tank battle. Nothing really interesting can come from it. Uh, none of it really scratches the surface of the topic. Uh, reasonable people can disagree with the conclusions that I reach. As I said, there are studies that get 
opposite results. My assessment of the literature did not fall on the side of Kleck, but that does not mean that Kleck is unreasonable. He is going about advocating for his position in a reasonable way, far more reasonable than anything you will read uh, in social media. Uh, Kleck is not unreasonable, he's just wrong. He's wrong because his methods are off and because more reliable data says that he's wrong. Uh, you can disagree reasonably. You can disagree unreasonably. Um, if you don't like my conclusions, you are welcome, but you're wrong. These are the conclusions that are supported by the data. When you are commenting, browse through the sources for this video. Uh, those are the sorts of things that convince me. I'm not terribly interested in your thoughts about anyone's personality, parentage, or anatomy. This channel is a no-drama zone, and baiting is never rewarded here. Merry Christmas, and yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker! Love makes me treat you the way that I do Gee, baby, ain't I good to you?